Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shree with From His Heart Ministries, and I want to thank you for watching today. We're in a series this month called Got Trouble, What to Do When You Don't Know What to Do. And today we're going to talk about how to get up when you've been knocked down. Troubles in life have a tendency to knock us down, but the good news is we don't have to stay down. God wants to pick us up and take us from the lowest low to the highest high. He wants to use our trouble to help us grow and experience His grace and power. So I invite you to open your Bible to the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, as we learn from this Old Testament prophet how to get up when you're down. Some of you may remember that in the late 80s, early 90s, there was a company that had a commercial on television. The company was called Life Call. It was a medical alarm company, and they produced this commercial. Actually, they produced a product, and they had the commercial to promote the product, but the product, very, very good. It was a little pendant that Elderly people who lived alone and disabled people who lived alone could wear this thing. It was a medical alert uh, pendant, and if they fell or they got in trouble, something happened and they needed help, they could just press that button, and it would immediately call this network, and people would be there to help them and call doctors and ambulances and things like that. Well, in that commercial, they, they didn't spend a lot of money on the commercial, and the commercial had uh, this kind of cheesy reenactment, and they uh, showed an elderly woman, and her walker was knocked over, and she was on the ground, and she presses the button, and they say, what can we do to help you? And she says, I've fallen, and I can't get up. Does anybody remember, I've fallen, and I can't get up? It became a catchphrase in American culture. I've fallen, and I cannot get up. Now, hey, when, when you fall down physically and you can't get up, it's good to have life call and you press the button and somebody can come and help you get up. But what do you do when you've fallen and you can't get up because life has mowed you down? It's not a physical fall. It's an emotional fall, a spiritual fall, a mental fall. It's, it's your life has been blindsided by life. How do you get up when you're down? It's a good question because life does that to us. To quote one of my favorite philosophers, Italian philosopher, Rocky Balboa, <laughs> he said, ain't nothing hits as hard as life. And so when life comes and smashes you and knocks you down. And maybe you're here today and you say, that's my story. Uh, Jeff, I, life has hit me out of the blue. Disaster has come. Divorce has come. Difficulties has come. Disease has come. I've fallen. And I can't get up. Hey, God has a word from his word today to speak to you to speak to your heart, to encourage you. One of my favorite verses, Romans 15, 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God is the God who can turn things around in your life. God is the God who can take the worst of situations and turn them into the greatest of blessings. Habakkuk was a man who knew what it was like to be down. Prophet who lived in the uh, late 600s, early 500s BC. Prophet who lived at a time when Judah was going out as a nation. Babylon was coming on the scene and God told Habakkuk, Babylon is coming and they're gonna wipe you guys out. And if you know anything about the history of Judah and Jerusalem, you'll know that in 605 B.C., Babylon came, and they came after them, and 
attacked the city and took back hostages, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. They were part of that group in 605 BC. And they put uh, Judah under their thumb. They're the big bad boys now. It used to be Assyria, but now it's Babylon with its king Nebuchadnezzar. And that happened in 605 and, and uh, Jerusalem had terrible trouble. And then in 597, Nebuchadnezzar came back because uh, Judah began to uh, flex its muscles and say, we don't have to pay you tribute, Nebuchadnezzar. So he came back, slapped him around some more, took more captives back to Babylon. And then in 586 BC, Judah said, we're not going to serve you. And Babylon came in and broke down the wall of the city and destroyed the temple. And there was complete and utter devastation. And if you want to read how bad it was, take time this afternoon and read the book of Lamentations. Jeremiah weeps and cries over the devastation that came upon Judah and Jerusalem. It, Habakkuk knows what it's life, what it's like for life to plow you over and knock you down. And he also knows how you get up when you're down. And in the book of Habakkuk, just three short chapters, he wrestles with God in chapter one, and then he embraces God in chapter three, and he says this, one of the greatest statements of faith in all of the Bible. Verse 17, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail and the fields produce no food, though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places for the choir director on my stringed instruments. Wow. How do you get up when life knocks you down? In these verses that we read, God gives us a three-step action plan to put into practice any time life knocks you for a loop. Step number one in the three-step action plan. Step number one is you run to God with your questions. You run to the Lord with your questions. Now, to be sure, when you get blindsided in life and things just slam and knock you down, you have questions. Hey, what happened here? Have you ever been in a car and you get hit in the car and you don't see it coming? I mean, it was in your blind spot or something like that, and all of a sudden, bam, it's like, well, where did that guy come from? Or, or you back into a telephone pole, and it's like, that wasn't there just a second ago. It just comes up out of nowhere, and you're just so startled. Well, anytime that happens, we have questions. Normal, natural to have questions. Habakkuk, whose name means to wrestle or to embrace, he's in chapter one, wrestling with God over the current state of affairs because in Judah, the nation Judah with its capital in Jerusalem, there is spiritual decline and corruption. There is moral decline and corruption. There is political decline and corruption. Everything is going down the tubes and God tells him Babylon is coming to totally wipe them out. I mean, it is bad news. And he starts it off and he says this, how long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. And then he goes on in chapter one to ask a series of why questions. Seven questions that he asked God in chapter one for whys. God, why don't you hear me? God, why don't you help me? You ever ask God that? When life blindsides, you ever ask God, hey, God, why aren't you hearing me? Hey, God, why aren't you helping me? It's an honest question. Hey, there's nothing wrong with asking questions like that. Jesus on the cross asked why. My God, oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So there's nothing wrong with that. We can come to God with our questions. He wants us to do that. 
He doesn't mind that we wrestle with him with the questions of life. But now remember this, when you come to God with your questions, always come with reverence. Always remember who you're talking to. You see, you're not talking to some high school clerk who miscounted your change. You're not talking to the shoeshine boy who missed a spot. You're talking to God, the God who spoke the worlds into existence. The scripture says in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 28 and 29, therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. You always come before the Lord with reverence and awe. The Lord, the Bible says in Psalm 47, is a great king over all the earth, a great king who is to be feared. So you always come with reverence. You always address God with reverence because he's a consuming fire. But then you always come with confidence because the great king over all the earth, the consuming fire, is daddy who loves you and loves me. Scripture says in Hebrews 4.16, therefore let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. If you have a, a pen or a pencil, circle that word confidence. Let us draw near with confidence. That word literally means freedom of speech. It means that we can come before the Lord and talk to the Lord about anything. We can pour out our heart to God. We can share those things that bother us. We can share those questions that we have. Nothing is off limits. If you come with reverence and you come with awe, God says, hey, the the door is open. You come and talk to me and you share your heart with me. That's how you get close to God. When you're vulnerable with God, when you share things with God, when you don't share with God and you bottle up questions and you bottle up hurts and life knocked you down and you don't know why, but you're not going to go to God with it. Let me tell you, it's like burying toxic waste. It's just going to, you're going to try and push it down, but it's going to come up and you're not going to get rid of it. The way you get rid of those things is you pour out your heart to the Lord. You share those things with the Lord. You bring those questions to the Lord. You come with confidence, with freedom of speech, and talk to God about it. That's the first step in the action plan. What do you do when life knocks you for a loop? You run to God with your questions. Second step. Second step. You rejoice in him in your problems. Now, Habakkuk, in verse 17, he paints a picture of the worst economic collapse you can possibly have. I mean, we freak out in America when the Dow drops 300 points in a day. Oh, everything's falling apart. Well, what does he talk about? He lives in an agrarian society and there's no more agriculture. Everything's gone, though the fig tree should not blossom and there be no fruit on the vines. That's a bummer. Uh, We don't have any figs. We're a big fig producer, no figs, no fruit on the vines. No, no grapes there, though the yield of the olive should fail. Well, that's a problem because we're, we're a big olive producer. We got no olives. And the fields produce no food. We have no wheat. We have no barley. We have nothing in the fields. Well, at least we got our sheep, though the flock should be cut off from the fold. Now we don't have that. And there be no cattle in the stalls. We don't have anything. Everything is gone. Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. That's what he says. He said, what? You're going to exult in the Lord? The word exult literally means to become jubilant, to jump for joy. Now, that doesn't seem to match, does it? I mean, everything is gone, and the Dow Jones is at zero, and uh, there, there's famine, and when famine, when there's no food, there's famine, and when there's famine, there's death. And what's Habakkuk doing? He's, he's jumping for joy like a little kid before Christmas. Wow. You say, what, what are you smoking, pal? Hey, this is crazy. Why would you rejoice in the lack? He's not rejoicing in the lack. He's rejoicing in the Lord. 
Yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. You rejoice in him even in your problems. Now, you mark it down. I don't care what's going on in your life. You can make the choice to rejoice. You can make the choice to rejoice. Paul was in prison. He was waiting to get his head cut off. He didn't know if he was going to live or he was going to die. And he wrote the book of Philippians, which which is the book of joy. And he says in Philippians 4.4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. He just made a choice to rejoice. And you can too. Hey, Habakkuk looked out in chapter one. Everything is bad. And maybe you look out in your life today and you say, everything is bad. My job's bad. My family's bad. My future's bad. My health is bad. My outlook is bad. Hey, if your outlook is bad, try the up look and look up to God and jump for joy in him. Many of us were disappointed in the election because the moral issues of the day, traditional marriage and the protection of the unborn and the public acknowledgement of God, those things were put on the back burner and people voted primarily for the economy and for handouts and entitlements and things like that. And man, you you could wake up and be very discouraged, but you don't have to be discouraged. You can exult, you can jump for joy in the Lord. You know why? It's because the tomb is still empty. God is still God. His word is still true. My citizenship is still in heaven. The Lord is coming back for me. And the scripture says, look up, be watchful, for your redemption is drawing near. Hey, when everything gets dark and gets black and gets bleak, it just shows us we are one step closer to the Lord Jesus Christ returning for his own. And so we can exult, we can rejoice in him. Listen, nobody likes hard times. Nobody does. But we can't get away from the fact that the scripture says, in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, lovers of money, haters of God, haters of good. We're living in the last days, in the last of the last days, and we're going to experience that. And when you start talking about uh, no figs and no fruit and no yield of the olive and no food and the Dow Jones going down, 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 that could easily happen to us. And you don't have to walk around with headline hysteria saying, oh no, what's coming to the world? You can say, praise the Lord, it's getting gloriously dark. Jesus Christ is coming for me. And Jesus Christ is on his way. So I can exult, I can jump for joy in the Lord. You can make the choice to rejoice. And you say, well, Jeff, that sounds good, but I'm not like you. I mean, you seem to be a person who has lots of faith, but, but I don't have that much faith, and things are hard for me, and, and life has knocked me down, and, and I can't get up, and boy, I wish I could make the choice to rejoice, but I can't make that choice because I don't have the ability to do that. Well, you mark it down. Rejoicing is not an act of ability. It's an act of the will. Yet I will Rejoice in the Lord, he says. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. He did it by an act of the will. Now, no matter what's going on, I don't care. It doesn't have anything to do with ability. It has to do with you just making the choice and you taking your will and saying, you know what? I will do this. Rejoice in the Lord and praise the Lord. There is power when you praise God. He inhabits the praises of his people. A couple of years ago, Debbie and I were speaking at a family life marriage conference in Pennsylvania, in a city called the King of Prussia. Has anybody ever heard of King of Prussia, Pennsylvania? When I got the note that we were gonna be in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, I thought it was a joke. I thought, what kind of, who names a city King of Prussia? And Olin used to live in Pennsylvania or around there, and he said, yeah, that's a place, King of Prussia. They have a big mall there in King of Prussia. I would always get it kind of wrong. For some reason, it just didn't connect in my brain. I always called it the Prince of Russia. It's not the Prince of Russia. It was the King of Prussia. 
And so we arrive at the airport and I had, uh, we had some suitcases and I had a carry-on bag that had my computer and it had all my notes for the conference. We were gonna be there Friday night, all day Saturday, half day Sunday. I was gonna speak seven different times. There was hours and hours and hours of things that I was going to share. Well, when we got to the car at the airport, the car that was gonna pick us up, uh, he was taking care of our bags, so I just left my bags there and I got in the car and he failed to put my computer bag with all my notes in the car. So we get to the airport or to the hotel and I'm looking at him like, where's my black bag? Where's my computer bag? He's like, I don't know, I never saw it. I said to Debbie, what'd you do with my bag? She said, I don't know, I never saw it, it's your bag. I was like, I know, but I didn't wanna blame me. And so, um, <laughs> so, you know, you instantly start freaking out. It's like, where is it? And so you look all in the car again and you look under seats and you go in the trunk and you think maybe it got under the floor mat. I mean, all these stupid things, right? It's not there. So I tell the guy, I said, man, I gotta go back to the airport. I gotta find this bag. So I go back to the airport, it's about 40 minutes to get to the airport, go back to the airport, and gee, it's not there. What a shocker, right? You, don't, you can't leave a bag at the airport uh, that's a computer bag for 40 minutes to an hour and expect it, oh, it's right there on the curb, just where I left it. No, that, that doesn't work that way. So it wasn't there, and I looked around in the terminal, wasn't there, and talked to the person at the, the baggage claim. It's like, man, I lost this computer bag. Uh, you know, what do you think? Has anyone turned anything in? They said, no. And uh, yeah, I'm starting to freak out because it's like, I gotta, I'm, this is Thursday night. We're speaking tomorrow and I don't have any of my notes. And you might think, well, Pastor Jeff's pretty good on his feet. I'm not good for seven hours with no notes, right? <laughs> I need some help. And so uh, I gave him my phone number and said, well, if anybody turns it in, would you call me? And they kind of looked at me and laughed and like, we don't get a lot of computer bags turned back in. So, sorry. So I went back to the hotel and, and Debbie, was, she felt so bad for me. And uh, I just made a choice. I said, Lord, I'm not gonna freak out on this. I'm gonna choose to trust you and I'm gonna choose to thank you. You know where that bag is. And Lord, if you wanna get that bag back to me, then awesome, that would be so cool. But if you don't, then you have another plan and I'll just spend all day Friday before the conference just doing the best I can preparing. And so Lord, I'm just gonna trust you and I praise you through this. And Debbie and I started eating our meal for dinner. And then the phone rang, the cell phone rang. And it was somebody I didn't know. And the person on the other end said, are you Jeff Shreve? And I said, yes. And they said, we have your bag. I said, how much you want for it? I said, we don't want anything for it. We, they were so apologetic. We said, we're so sorry. We thought that was with our stuff. And so we put it in our bag. And they said, uh, I said, well, where are you? I'll, I'll go to you. And they said, no, no, we don't want you to go to us. We'll bring it to you. And so they got in their car and they drove 30, 40 minutes to me to get me my bag back. And I thought, wow, it's just like God. And it happened after I praised him and I thanked him regardless of the situation, regardless of the circumstances. I'm going to trust you, Lord, and I'm gonna praise you, Lord, and I'm gonna exult in you and rejoice in the God of my salvation. You're still God, you're still good, you still love me, you still work all things together for good to those who love you, to those who are called according to your purpose. And God worked a miracle in response to the praise. Have you noticed how God does that? Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas preaching in Philippi and then beaten because they cast out a demon of this girl who was bringing much profit to her masters because she could uh, foretell the future. And uh, all of a sudden, these people get mad. They turn on Paul and Silas. They beat them with rods. They throw them in prison. They put them in the inner stocks. They're bleeding. They're hurting. They're in the stocks. And it says, but about midnight, Paul and Silas began to pray, and they were singing hymns of praise, and the prisoners were listening. And when they sang hymns of praise... God answered and God sent a jailhouse rock and God caused the chains to fall and the doors to open and there was a great revival that took place in the prison house and it all started because they praised. 
What do you do when life knocks you down? You exult in the Lord. You rejoice in the God of your salvation. Listen, if you're struggling today with depression, the very best medicine for depression is praise, to praise the Lord because it lifts you up and it takes you to a new place and it helps you to see life from God's perspective. Habakkuk, in the midst of terrible situations that he could foresee that were coming, he said, I'm gonna exult in the Lord. I'm gonna make that choice and you can make that choice too. And third step, the third step in the action plan. Not only do you run to him with your questions, not only do you rejoice in him and your problems, but you rely on him to see you through. You rely on the Lord to see you through, and not just so you can survive, but so you can thrive, so that you can go to new heights with the Lord Jesus Christ. Habakkuk is wrestling in chapter one, asking all the questions. How long, O Lord, will you not answer me? Why don't you hear me? Why don't you help me? Why are you using a wicked people like the Babylonians to come and wipe out your people. I mean, we're not doing very good spiritually and morally and politically and socially, but we're still better than the Babylonians. Why on earth, God, would you use a country and a people so wicked as the Babylonians to discipline your folks? It doesn't make sense. And so he's wrestling with God over all these things. His name means to wrestle, but his name also means to embrace. And he, in chapter three, at the end of the book, he embraces God. And worry turns to worship, and fear turns to faith, and terror turns to trust as he looks to the Lord, as he prays the Lord, as he trusts the Lord. And he trusts the Lord to see him through. He says in verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high Places. The Lord God, that is Adonai Yahweh in the Hebrew. Adonai Yahweh. Adonai, Yahweh is the personal name of God. And Adonai means ruler, means sovereign. And the Lord God, and maybe in some of your Bibles you have this translation, the sovereign Lord. Adonai Yahweh means sovereign Lord. The one who's in control, the king of kings and Lord of lords. And he says, the Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, he's the one I praise, and he is my strength. And I look to him, and I'm gonna rely upon him. Listen, God is able to deliver. He's able to deliver you. I don't care what circumstances you're facing. I don't care if it's terrible, horrible disease, cancer, or Crohn's, or whatever it might be. He is able to to deliver you. When it says, I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, the word salvation literally means deliverance. And the Bible says, God is to us a God of deliverances, and to God the Lord belong escapes from death. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians chapter one. He said, indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves in order that we should not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. Now watch this. Who delivered us from so great a peril of death and will deliver us, he on whom we have set our hope and he will yet deliver us. God is the God who has delivered. God is the God who will deliver. Take it to the bank. God is the God who will deliver you and will deliver me. He's the God of our salvation, the God of deliverances. And in whatever you face, you can trust God to deliver you. Paul, he says this, interesting, at the end of his life, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he said, at my last offense, no one supported me. Everyone deserted me, but the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, and he'll deliver me from every evil deed. You know, Paul the way he died, he got his head chopped off. And even in the midst, and knowing that he, his time had come and he was gonna be martyred for his faith, he said, the Lord will deliver me from every evil deed. God is going to take me up, and, and I can trust God. He is able to deliver. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel chapter three were told to bow before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And Nebuchadnezzar said, if you don't bow when I 
strike up the band. I'm going to throw you in a furnace of blazing fire. Well, they didn't bow. And it was told to Nebuchadnezzar, hey, the three boys, Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they don't bow, king. They're not going to do what you say, king. And Nebuchadnezzar got so mad because he's like, I'm Nebuchadnezzar. You're going to do what I say. So he calls them up. Hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm going to give you another chance. I'm going to strike up the band. And when I strike up the band, you bow before the image. And if you don't bow before the image, I'm going to throw you in a furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you from my hand? And they said to the king, the most powerful human being on the earth at that time, they said, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this, O king. We're not going to bow. And let me tell you one thing. Our God, who is, a- is able to deliver us from your hand, and he will deliver us. And even if he doesn't choose to deliver in this way, we're not going to bow. We're going to trust God, who is a God of salvation, who's a God of deliverance. Wow, and you know the story. He threw them in the furnace, and Jesus was there. He was the fourth man in the fire, and he delivered them from that fiery furnace. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation, in the God of deliverance, in the tough situations in life. Trust God, look up to God, rely upon God, because he will deliver you, and he's able to empower you. The Lord God is my strength, he says, The sovereign Lord is my strength. Now, it's such a contrast because in chapter 1, verse 11, the Lord says this about the Babylonians, their strength is their God. Don't ever let your strength be your God. Let God be your strength. But those who wait upon the Lord, Isaiah 40, 31 says, shall renew their strength when you wait on God, when you let God be your strength. Now, if you think in terms of a strong man in the Bible, an Old Testament strong man, every kid knows that has ever looked at a children's Bible, they always have the story of Samson in children's Bibles. And Samson is the, he's the Israeli strong man. I mean, Samson always is depicted as this guy with just bulging muscles, and he's the guy that killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. God was Samson's strength, and when Samson got his hair cut, which was a symbol of the power of God on his life, the Bible says that he shook himself, he was going to go out and shake himself free when Delilah woke him and said, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. I will go out as at other times and shake myself free, he said, and the scripture says this, he did not know that the Lord had left him. And he was weak as a kitten. And they grabbed him and abused him and gouged out his eyes and led him away to grind grain like a dumb ox. Strength is all from God. And God says, hey, if you will make me your strength, I will empower you. I can do all things, Paul said, through Christ who strengthens me. And here's the cool thing. Not only is God able to deliver you and me, not only is he able to empower you and me, he's able to take us to new heights. How to get up when you're down and not just get up and barely stagger, but to get up to new heights. That's what he says. He says, he has made my feet like hind's feet and makes me walk on my high places. I did a little study about a hind. I'm not a hunter, so I have to learn about these things, but a, a hind is a, a red deer, a female red deer, lives in the mountains, and a hind is one of the most sure-footed animals of the mountains, and here's why a hind is so sure-footed, because when a hind runs, the back legs always go in the exact spot that the front legs were in. And so you can watch one of these things and they can go up a ledge and they can move around in in rough mountainous areas and jump up and get higher and higher and higher and run away from danger where you and I couldn't do that. Other animals can't do that. But if you can place your back feet in the exact same spot that your front feet were in, you can go up all sorts of of slippery places. And the Lord says, hey, if you will make me your strength, if you will rejoice in me, 
I'll, I'll make your feet like hinds feet. I'll give you steady and sure feet so that you can handle any situation and you can climb higher and higher and higher. Not only can you get up when you're down, but you can get up and ascend. You can go high with the Lord. The Lord can change everything in your life. Psalm 23 is a favorite psalm for so many people. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Now, he says, even though I walk through the valley. He didn't say, even though I have to live in the valley, even though the valley is my home and I'm gonna be here forever. He, no, 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 no. I'm walking through the dark valley of the shadow of death and the shepherd leads us through that valley. Why? So we can come up on the other side, come up to the high place, come up to the green pasture, but you have to go through and he's gonna lead you through and he's not gonna leave you alone. He'll make your feet like hinds feet so that you can walk on your high places. Now, this is really cool as we close out. Habakkuk starts off the book wrestling with God, asking why. He ends the book embracing God, focused not on why, but focused on whom. His hope is built in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, so to speak. He's just focused on God. He's saying, God, all this other stuff is happening around me, and no matter how bad it gets, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God, I'm just gonna rejoice in you, and God, you're gonna lead me up higher and higher. You're gonna take me through the valley of the shadow of death. I don't need to be worried about any of that stuff, and I don't need to be living in fear. I need to be walking in faith. And what a word of encouragement for us today. Listen, I don't know what circumstances are facing you. God does, and you do. And you may very well be here watching on TV, listening on the radio, watching on the internet, and you say, That's, I, I live knocked down. Life has blindsided me like an 18-wheeler T-boning somebody in the intersection just out of nowhere. Hey, what do you do in that situation when you're knocked down like that? I mentioned to you the great philosopher, Rocky Balboa. Rocky said this. It ain't about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. It's about how much you can take and keep moving forward forward. Get up. Get up. God is not done with you yet. God is not done with us yet. And in your life, if you'll focus on the Lord, you say, my circumstances are tough. Quit living under your circumstances and start living under the Lord and under his grace and under his power. He will change everything in your life if you'll do it. My friend, I don't know what kind of trouble you might be in today, but God does. He knows all about it, and He cares, and He wants to work a miracle. Listen, if you're watching, the first step to receiving that miracle is to make sure that you're connected to the Lord, to make sure that He really lives inside. If you're not 100% sure about that, that you've ever truly received Christ as Savior and Lord, today is the day for you. Just pray this simple prayer. Just say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost. I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. I believe you're God in the flesh. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Come into my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same and your trouble will start to change for the good. I would love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer. 
please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You are important to God and you're important to us and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Pastor Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real